Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Austin McDaniel. I'm a home loan specialist here in our corporate office in Brentwood, Tennessee. And we have all kind of good tips and tricks to go over with you guys on why it's worth investing in real estate. Um, you guys are gonna have some questions. Make sure you put those in the chat and we're gonna go over those questions uh, at the end in our Q&A session. One of our core convictions at Churchill is having the heart of a teacher. And I can't think of any better teachers on this specific topic than the people that are here with me today. Yeah, thank you, Austin. I'm Christina McCollum. I am actually all the way from the Pacific Northwest here in Tennessee today. Um, I am a market leader and I own two investment properties, which we'll get into today, but Mr. J is the big one here today. Well, thank you. I uh, am Jay Garvins and I'm a home loan specialist actually in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, but I'm also on top of being a father and a husband, I'm a real estate investor. Uh, my wife and I have eight properties. Uh, seven of them are income generating, five of them in Colorado, and then two generate income here in Tennessee, one in Franklin and one in the Smoky Mountains. We've been doing it for over 10 years. Uh, we took a break and then we did it when we were younger in our relationship as well, but now we've got a portfolio of real estate that pays a residual income and that's what we wanna talk about today. And to start off the discussion, I just wanna ask um, three questions. What, if you're listening to this webcast, has held you back from owning an investment property before? What's your main obstacle? Is it fear? Is it knowledge? Hopefully today we're gonna help you answer that question. Secondly is, what's your main motivation for wanting to do it? See, our motivation with Marlo and I, Christina, was that she gave up her career as an IT specialist with FedEx Corporation to raise our two children. Mm -hmm. And she said, Jay, you've got a 401k, you've got military retirement, your social security is gonna be bigger than mine because you've been in, I, I want something for me. And I said, honey, let's buy you an investment property and now we call it the three little houses. She has three houses with no <laughs> mortgages, $2,000 a month, $6,000 with the three combined, $72,000 a year for being a full-time mom and shoe shopping. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty good deal. So we continue to do that and now we're at eight, but we just wanna do what's passionate. This seminar is not about the money, uh, it's about the freedom that you get and simply understanding there's different investment strategies in life and one of them is owning rental properties which gives you residual income. Mm -hmm. Jay, I'm glad you said strategy because that's really important. I think that if you're watching today, just know that wherever you're at in your journey, right, we're right there with you. And we have a couple different examples that we'll throw out today. Austin has a primary residence and looking to invest in his next I mean, investment yeah. property, right, Austin? So probably like most people that are on this webinar that have not gotten into you know investment properties or whatever, I'm one of those people. And I want to start that journey and owning your first property, which we'll get into later, but that's that first step as mm -hmm. far as making that possible. Yeah, and, and we just purchased our first uh, second property, which is, you know, our non-primary. So that's our first investment. And really we want to go that direction where Jay's at, where he owns several. So whether you're not owning your first primary residence or do, right. or you own maybe one or two, or you're looking to become Mr. Jay. We um, all want to be Jay. Yeah, we do. We want to, <laughs> we want to grow up to be Jay. And we're going to show you a little bit about that today. But I do think that, you know, this is scary for some people. So we're just going to walk them through it today. I think that's a great point because the third thing is, is the economic environment even right right now? I mean, for investment property ownership, can it work? The economy is scary, uh, inflation is up, uh, the prime interest rate is up from 2.5% to 7.75%. We're gonna address all those things today. Okay, so the purpose of the class is offering a foundation. Mm -hmm just from an investment standpoint, comparing that to traditional philosophies and strategies, providing you with some insight through our conversation for a roadmap of what you do next, and then determining your investment strategy. You know, Christina, your strategy is far different than Marlo and mine. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and you're gonna hear some vocabulary and we're gonna try to break it down. Austin and I will talk a lot about what Jay's talking about because Jay is the expert really. <laughs> um, and we want you guys to be able to relate to this information. So do definitely remember that you can add your questions in the chat and we'll go over them at the end. But throughout this, just type them in there so that we can get like a running flow of what we're not talking about during the presentation so that we can come back and talk about it again, right Austin? Yeah, exactly. And in the, about this class too, it's essentially just a viable alternative to traditional you know, investments and stuff like that. So it's not a get rich scheme of, of trying to you know, convince you to do something that you're not comfortable with or whatever, but if you are one of those people that have that chunk of cash or are saying, I wanna diversify my portfolio, what does investing in real estate look like and you know, what are some questions that I don't even know to ask yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about today seven streams of income. And Jay put this together and I think it's incredibly intelligent that there are seven ways that you can make money as an individual. Let's talk about the first two. Right. Austin's you know I mean? gonna go over that. Honestly, I mean, you got your traditional cookie cutter kind of income, your W-2 job that's gonna, you know, you're gonna basically exchange time for money, essentially is how that's gonna work. And obviously that's majority of people, Americans that are out there, as far as 95% of the population is just a traditional earned income, daily work kind of job. Um, other is business owners, so you're, you know, big wig peoples like, you know, Jeff Bezos and uh, the business owners out there, essentially your big profit and loss is kind of what that comes down to. And so if you're a business owner, that's, you know, your other stream of income earning, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I love those. Those are those are things that we do every day, sure, right? right? We're number one, usually. And if you can own a business, you are super blessed to do that. Right. Um, some things that we talk about later today is gonna be residual income. So here's an example of residual income. It's income or, sorry, savings that you have in your account. Now, my husband, when he was working for the government, he was a contractor. So he kept all of his funds in his savings account. And at the end of every year, right, Austin, right. They, they give you a small tiny check for all the interest that you're able to earn on the savings in your checking or savings account. Right. And, and that's interest income. And you should be seeing those documents coming in the mail for your taxes. This is that time of year. It's so, that time of year. So you might have seen some small amount, some small pay on that interest income. Another one is dividend income. Dividends are where you own stock. Now, um, Austin and I both like Jeeps, so we wanna throw out the <laughs> example that if you buy stocks in Jeep, you are a stock owner and that is gonna be paid to you in dividends, right? right? Owners are paid dividends, which in a way is interest income, in a way. Exactly. And I have a great example for you on this. Um, promissory notes was one of the examples we threw out and Jay has a great example of how he had a promissory note in which it earned income for him, right Jay? Yes, um, when I sold Garvin's Mortgage Group, uh, partnered with Churchill Mortgage, we had some extra money so my wife and I invested in a 501c3 nonprofit and they wanted $50,000 to invest it in Uganda for microloans and they were going to give us 7% for seven years and then they'd get back with us. Mm -hmm. And we did that back in 2015. It was just in Christmas of this year that they sent us an $80,000 check because we blessed the ministry and then the ministry blessed us back. And it came at a great time because it helped pay for a little bit of my son's college. <laughs> but there's so many different types, Christina. We cr uh, continue on with capital gains. Um, capital gains is the most common place or popular form of investment for Americans. Over 180 million or 54% of all Americans invest in the traditional market of 401ks, IRAs, and in some cases, common stocks. Now, common stocks with a dividend will produce an income while you have that investment either appreciating or depreciating. But 401ks are amazing, but they're a pile of money that you put in and your company puts in during your time. And then at the end of your life, you take scoops of money off that pile to the pile is gone. Residual income, whether it's a dividend, whether it's interest, or whether now coming on to royalties and rental income, it always produces a profit and never touches the principal balance of the original asset. 
So the next one is royalties. Mm -hmm. uh, Dolly Parton, right here in Tennessee. Love Dolly has written a lot of great songs and every single one of those songs has a royalty as does land in oklahoma for oil as does justin bieber when he cuts a tune that is a residual royalty and this is where we come to rental income it's just saying well there's seven different ways to secure your future for you personally or your family we're talking about rental income, residual income where you buy a house, but you don't live in it, someone else does. Because the saying goes, you don't make money on the house that you live in, you do on one that someone else lives in. And we'll repeat that over and over. Because owning a house is a great asset, but it's a money pit. Everybody that buys a house knows that you put more money into it than you ever get out of it until you've owned it five to seven to ten years and we're talking long-term strategies here today right uh, there's also direct income because i don't know exactly where pensions and retirement funds and all of that fall into but individuals some online and some research i did uh, do refer to that as direct income today we're going to talk and compare it to traditional investments mm -hmm. now jay said earlier that his goal or his plan and strategy is mm -hmm. to be able to say that he is able to produce income from all of those sources, right? That's yeah, so and this should be your goal just to research mm -hmm. and see how many sources of income you have in those. Yep. Which is incredible because I don't know that, like Austin and I, mm -hmm. we didn't know that there were this many sources I of mean, income out there. Right? Seeing it laid out like that is really, I mean, that's really cool to kind of see all the different ways that you can actually right. make income mm -hmm. as far as that's Good concerned. Fun. So yeah. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about investments. So we're going to go over traditional investments like the ones Jay had um, mentioned a few minutes ago versus real estate investments. And why that's important, we're going to go into detail. But this is an example for um, us to go over with you. Jay, do you want to go over this yep, one? Yep, absolutely. See, it's very simple. You take $100,000 of your hard-earned income through your earned income job. You share with your company. Uh, they put some in, you put some in, and then it grows 10%. Your $100,000 turns into $110,000, okay? Now, if you buy an investment property with real estate, your money just doesn't appreciate on your down payment. It appreciates on the entire asset. And this is very unique to United States. France has the 30-year fixed mortgage. Israel has a 30-year uh, fixed mortgage. But places like Mexico or Korea or India don't have this. So it's very unique to us in the United States where you can put $100,000 down for this example on a home. You buy a $400,000 home. The asset appreciates 10% and a $400,000 house becomes $440,000. So you make $40,000 off the asset, but that's 40% of your down payment or your risk or investment in it. And that's a huge concept. That's how Marlo and I went from uh, six to seven to eight houses that had mortgages to now they don't have mortgages to where we found that our assets and our worth have almost doubled right and we didn't do anything yeah. except the initial steps of moving forward and finally taking the plunge into investment property ownership right. and there's a transformational truth with this you guys this is the most one of the most important slides here is because it shows you how small the circle of people that are around you even do what we're talking about today. Um, and you can do this. I honestly believe residual income through investment property ownership is one of the fastest, most viable, and possibly one of the last ways that middle class Americans can build wealth, generational wealth for right. their family. And it is in US, there's over $40 trillion in assets right now in the stock market. And if you're watching this, please understand that these numbers change every day. Um, the interest rates we're going to show you change. The values of the house and the rents change. So we try to be very accurate, but we want you to get the big picture, the long-term gain that we're looking at. We're a conservative tribe, and there's about $40 trillion in the stock market. And 
54% of Americans are about 180 million Americans invest in that. And that's a very big water hole, but a lot of people are on that water hole drinking. And with residual, or I mean, I'm sorry, residential, there's about 40 trillion people, Christina, that mm -hmm. own houses, about 65% of Americans. There's 215 million Americans that own those houses but those are the houses they live in and they're not an income source. Yeah, so going back to the concept we talked about earlier, it, it really is where Austin is at and where I'm going and into Jay's experience. It's, you know, it's, there is wealth in owning your own home, but owning your own home doesn't make you a wealthy person necessarily long-term with this long-term play. Owning somebody else's home does. And why that's important today, we'll go into a little more detail, but I think it's important to know that while it can seem scary to own homes that you don't live in, right? I think that's one of the biggest It's scary. It example, can really be scary. Is, is that we're talking about creating wealth in a way that, what was Jay told us earlier, it's 401k. 401k with the front door. Yeah. Which is, that's that's, that's an awesome concept. Well, <laughs> Phoebe had friends would say it's a 401, you know? That's so good. And if you own a property and you want to turn it short-term rental, it'll be like Ross. What is he doing? Oh. Pivot. Pivot. Yeah. Pivot. 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 So this transformational truth is that there's only 10 million Americans, 3% of Americans, that actually own an investment property. That is a statistic by the IRS. You have to file a Schedule E, it's on your 1040, and it's very, very trackable. But Christina, a majority of those individuals are accidental investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it, yeah, accidental, so accidental, let's describe that real yeah. quick. Accidental investor is your grandmother passes away and she leaves you a house, there's already a tenant in it, and you're like, well, grandma had a renter, I'll keep it. Yeah. Or nobody's in the house, but the, Ohio, it, the house is in Ohio, so instead of selling it right now because it's a bad time, mm -hmm. I'll put a renter in there. Right. But the most popular one actually is military personnel. Mm -hmm. They move, they're call of duty, calls them over to Carolina from Colorado. They can't sell their house. Their real estate agent, they go for them for answers and they say, you know what? Don't worry about it, let's just put a renter in there. Mm -hmm. And that's an accidental investor. It's a great way to start. A lot of people I know started that way, but less, this is amazing, less than a million people, 0.3% of Americans do four or more properties owned, three or more on a Schedule E, which I refer to as intentional investors. Um, and this is important because you have 99% of Americans that are not intentional investors. But the IRS statistic is that of 71% of all Americans that declared a million dollars or more on their annual income return over the last 50 years had real estate investment activities involved. Okay. So which camp do you want to be in, Austin? Do you want to be with 99% of the Americans that don't invest in real estate? Or do you want to be with 71% of the millionaires that do? I feel like the millionaires, obviously, it's the proof's in the pudding, obviously. It kind of speaks for itself. So 71% of millionaires, I mean, majority of their wealth is essentially from real estate, yeah. you know, where it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, I think Jay is saying that if you and I want to become millionaires someday, that we really need to consider <laughs> investing and in it's real not, estate, right? It's not about the money. I really don't care about money, but I am in love with the freedom. I mean, so much so, my wife says, Jay, every time you turn around, you want to buy a house. I think I'm going to call you a houseaholic. <laughs> you know, Jay, that's a very good point, because I am also. I definitely think my husband, Joe, gets a little stressed out. But I do want you guys to know, think about the individuals, the opposite scale of a millionaire, right? Sure. I mean, I know there's stress in not owning your own home, right? Being yeah, a renter, and money doesn't make you happy. Being a renter is a stressful thing. You're held hostage by the landlord and rising rent costs and all mm -hmm. of that. And you can, you know, with investing, you get to choose your stress, right? I right. mean, it, it almost, I would call it a good stress mm -hmm. in a way. And I mean, how many Americans really suffer from being stressed out and right. and the intentional part is really important we're going to talk more about right that. yeah so let's 
dive in. Now the next three or four slides are going to be pretty deep. Um, I'm going to explain how we're going to analyze the deal. And it's not as difficult as you think. I want to take it in layman's terms. Even before I go into the strategy, I want you to have one or two concepts. One, what are the income sources that I shared? That's important because no one ever shared that with me before. The second one is knowing whether it's a right decision to invest in a property, whether it makes money and it adds value or just loses money and causes stress. If you're driving down the road and you see a house that's listed that you like that is $400,000, you can stop and see what the price of it is right on realtor.com or from a link from your agent. Your spouse or your friend who's ever with you can go on rentals.com, see that that house rents for $2,500 a month. That's $30,000 a year. So take your smartphone calculator, 2,500 times 12, that's 30,000 divided by 400,000, the value of the asset, and that's 7.5%, 30,000 divided by 400,000. And Christina, we have the capitalization rate. We're going right. to talk about that today. Right, which is just a fancy way of saying a benefit, right? We talked about that earlier. Yeah. It's, it's just you benefiting from the property now acquired. So it, it can be really simple. Mm -hmm. And it's simple math. But right, Austin, most of us don't have $400,000 to buy a house for cash. Right. So what we do is we're left with the capitalization rate for someone that owns it outright, and that calculation shares that. The uh, Gold standard for the capitalization rate is 10%. If you can buy a $175,000 asset, get $17,400 a month in, uh, in a year in rent, then you're gonna have 10%. If you find one that your capitalization calculation is 2%, run and hide. Do not buy that house. It's not a good idea. So here, most important is that we don't have $400,000 to buy a house, so we're now gonna refer to return on investment. So if you hear things like cap rate or ROI, that's what your friends, investors, real estate agents, or mortgage lenders are talking about. So you have your down payment, that's 100,000. I'm gonna use an example of 25%. Again, our tribe is conservative. You can put down less, 20% for an investment property. That's not the purpose. But you have about a $2,200 a month mortgage payment. In this example that I took right from Nashville, right on the borders of Brentwood, rent is $2,550. Okay, that is a $330 a month approximate profit. But you also have to times that by 12 and you get $3,900, just under $4,000 in actual collected rent. Don't forget, that's on the front end, like Christina said. On the back end, you've got almost $4,000 of principal reduction that your tenant is paying. See, your tenant is paying your 401k, not you. And if you take 3,900 plus 3,900, that equals 7,900, and that's 7.9% 7 return on investment of your $100,000 investment. And that's without any appreciation. So we want you to understand that concept. With 6% appreciation, my wife and I got super excited and we're like, wow, we made 30% last year. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a viable approach. It's, and it's it's cool too because, I mean, that's just from that previous slide, I mean, that's just after year one. That's just year one. So obviously when people do see that, we're like, this could change and it's going to continue to improve as appreciation mm -hmm. does. Same with rents and everything else like that. Your rents, Austin, they gonna go up or down in the future? When I was renting, they pretty much went up every single year. Yeah. Even in the Great Recession, when the economy was falling apart, you can look statistically, rent stayed even. Now with inflation, rents are going up even faster, which worries me for the renters. Mm -hmm. But also let's talk about reality, you guys. There is in income generating properties, a lot of expenses beyond collecting the rent. Now, Jay, let me interrupt real quick. When we gave that example on the previous slide, that's for one house. Uh -huh. Remember, Jay owns eight houses, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, so, so really, I mean, with each added investment property, you're just 
doubling, tripling your efforts. I know that sometimes, and we're gonna talk about it in a minute, it can feel like this investment benefit is marginal, right? Because we have spouses that are gonna say, Austin, that's too much of a risk <laughs> and not enough of a reward, true, right? True. And that's what I think people are having the hardest time with is, yeah. is does the risk outweigh the reward? It's baby steps and you only, you're listening to this webcast, only go as fast as emotionally and intellectually you have to go to make it a safe investment. I ripped off the Band-Aid, folks. I did them all on 15-year mortgages. So in the beginning, it looked like I was doing negative cash flow, mm -hmm. where my mortgage payment was more than the rent. But instead of reducing $200 a month, my, la my tenant was paying $700 a month. And I wasn't breaking even at all. I was making $500 more than the 15 uh, the 30 year mortgage but i was making it on the back yeah. end right so it was very front loaded for jay and, yeah. and and i was just talking to um a reporter about 15 year mortgages you're paying mm -hmm. more principal than interest i know which is incredible and if your renter is paying that principal for you it's all upside right right i know it's and it's upside. it's it's all exciting um Every time I do this uh, webcast, I want to go buy another house yeah. and my wife yeah. locks me in a cage for three days. We're until, all making yeah. offers later today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. House of Holly, uh -huh. that's right. Yep. House of Holly. Okay, so what we're looking at now, and yes. thank you for that uh, input, Christina, is we have property management expenses. There's debt servicing, there's lease up fees, there's occupancy, vacancies, all of this. So let's just one more slide of detail and then we're just gonna cruise through conversation. So would See, you say, Jay, this is the not exciting part, is the expenses, <laughs> This right? The yeah. expenses is not the exciting part. I mean, you've got a gross rent of $2,500 here, but look at it, your occupancy rate is not always gonna be 100%. Mine has been for single family homes, but you had the example that we'll touch on in a minute, that's different for uh, multifamily, but also you have management fees. Yeah. See, yeah. my wife and I manage the properties ourselves because she is a stay-at-home mom right now and is transitioning back into accounting and she's passionate about it. But some people pay as much as 7%, 10% short-term rentals. That's, yeah, 20%. Yeah. 30%. It, it, but it, if you can manage it yourself, that's ideal, ideal. right? It is, but yeah. we all have busy lives. Yeah. So I'm going to use the example of 7.5%. I also put utilities and garbage up here, which I'm gonna put at zero because for single family, you will not have that cost as a landlord, but as a investment property owner that does a multifamily or a short-term rental, you're gonna have these expenses and you need to account for it. I have accounted for a budgeted maintenance, so you have 1000 to $1,500 a year to fix things like faucets and doorknobs, and you have your debt service. So here is the most sobering slide. Mm -hmm. You take your rent at 2550 times a 95% occupancy rate which leaves you with 2422. You also have to deduct the management fee which is $181 and you're left with 2241 in this example. Your debt service is 2221 Congratulations, you're making about $20 a month, about three, four cups of coffee, and this is where people get scared. But just hold your breath and watch this, because the final slide of crunching numbers is your net ROI after deductions. Now, stick with me here. You have $20 of your annual net operating income times 12 months for the actual profit on your rent of 240. Again, you have your principal reduction of 3,900. See where if this is $12,000 in a 15 year, you go much faster actually. Plus the appreciation, we're just doing 6%. We don't know what it's gonna be this year. It was approximately 8.5% in Colorado last year in, um, Tennessee, yeah, Nashville, yeah. it was 15.6, 15 15. and Eastern Washington. Eastern Washington did really well last year. Yeah. Yeah. What did it do? Like 20-some percent? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And definitely it, this year is, well, sorry, 2022 uh -huh. was slower. And probably. this year is going to be a flat year. We don't predict more than 1% to 3% in Colorado, but now is the time which will show you 
to be bold and at least do research while others are fearful. So in this final calculation, you've got 240 plus 3,900 plus your appreciation taken from, divided by your $100,000 investment is 28% net ROI. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never had one of my 401ks do 28% in ever, let alone just one year. Right. Well, I think it's kind of like the what we were talking about from from before of what what are people's fears, what are people concerned about, and everything. A lot of people will just see they'll see twenty dollars a month as far as what I'm going to be netting monthly on that rental income. But it's like an iceberg; you really don't see the full iceberg. You see a little bit of it above the water, but below is where all the magic's happening. Yeah, that's where your renter is reducing your right. principal down, right? So yes, you might carry a loan with your first investment, right? And as that payment goes down, that principal reduction is happening. And to Austin's point of the iceberg, you know, you might see $20 on the surface, right? right? And that's where we see that coming off the bottom end. And appreciation mm -hmm. as well, too. I mean, this, yeah. I mean, this is I mean, it is grow. very exciting. Yeah. It is yeah. very exciting. And it is similar, but in the opposite respect to the debt snowball, where this just starts to snowball. And before we knew it, my wife and I are like, oh my word, we've almost got these loans paid off. Mm -hmm. right. Now we're much older, <laughs> my wife and I, than the people at this table, but the philosophy of real estate needs to be for you. If someone's like, Jay, I wanna get started today, I'm gonna say, hey, how leveraged are you? Do you have student debt? Do you have car debt? Do you have credit card debt? That's your biggest focus, not investment property. We've done it conservatively and we will always share with you to consider that approach as well. Do you go high leverage or low leverage? We're gonna talk about flips, rehabs and turnkey, multifamily versus single, cash flow versus appreciation, and then timing on the market. And then we're gonna open it up to questions and answers. Um, high leverage versus low leverage. And it's important that you wanted to touch base on this. Yeah. So. I think Jay said it. It has to meet your financial needs, right? If your um, Austin's in a good place where he's been in his primary residence for a couple years now, sure. Mm -hmm. So him and his wife are going to have to start thinking about what's next, or they'll want to, not have to, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and for my husband and I, we were we live in Washington and we visit Florida a lot, and we have five kids, so you know. Joe's grandma doesn't want us at her house all the time. She does, but um, <laughs> you as a mother, those mothers listening out there, sometimes you just want to be in your own home. And so we bought a second home in Florida that we go back and forth. Now our dream forever will be to be snowbirds, which I think when I was young, I never told myself, <laughs> I want to be a snowbird. But when you're an investor, you're like, I just want to go and be and free and, and be in my properties and see them. And yeah. um, so for us, a second home was a good fit. Um, if we weren't traveling back and forth, we probably would have considered uh, investment property like Jay with his rental properties and his renters. But for me and Austin, we're gonna have to think about what meets our needs financially right. and how we can go out there and accomplish those. And we're gonna go about that here in the next few minutes on different property types, right? We are, and it's so important because at Churchill Mortgage, we're here to help you. We have a heart of a teacher, but we are a conservative tribe. High leverage, means less money down, and that means you are possibly gonna have more risk, um, and you might have more stress. So I'd rather coach someone to get rid of more debt and save more down payment, and don't worry about losing timing on the market, because real estate will always be an asset, like I told you, some of the wealthiest people have been doing it for hundreds of years. Benjamin Franklin was a landlord. Ben? Ben was a landlord. <laughs> so remember what got us into trouble in 2007 is that high leverage and everything fell down. So let's have fun now. Let's talk about flips, rehabs, uh, turnkeys. Uh, what the heck is a turnkey? It's just a fancy name for a move-in ready house. What about the flips and rehabs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Austin, if you buy your first rental, will you do the work yourself? Absolutely not. No, I'm <laughs> dangerous with a hammer, uh, <laughs> screwdrivers. Nope, no thank you. So the flips are probably not going to be the best avenue for us. Okay, so turnkey is something that, I, what would you say, Jay? What is, if people are buying their first investment property, are they leaning heavily to turnkey versus flips where they're doing their own sweat equity? I'm a single family guy. That's the only investment properties that we own. All of ours 
in Colorado are built between 1952 and 1956. They're a three bedroom, two bath house with a one car garage, one of the nicest houses, the smallest house on the street, off the main artery, but close enough to the freeway. Mm -hmm. And we're getting a, a couple or a single working parent with school aged kids. And it's your medium sized house in your middle to upper neighborhoods the least expensive and the smallest one on the street. So right. they were turnkey, so you got people into them right away. Yep, okay. and they were fixed up. Mm -hmm. uh, they were ready to go. Three of them I bought from the owners and two of them I bought from individuals that had flipped and I let them make the money. Yeah. Right. I didn't have the time or the interest. So real quick before we move on, flipping just means that's a short-term concept, right? We're purchasing and acquiring. Yep. yep. We're maybe doing some repairs and we're selling it off. Yep, it's just taking an asset, improving it, and selling it for a profit. Really good idea in 2019, not so much in 2023. It's a little yeah. bit more challenging. Yeah. yeah. And this, Christina, this is down your alley because I'm kind of scared and not as familiar with multi uh, okay. multifamily. Mm -hmm. yeah. My wife and I have chose single family, just keep it simple. We use the KISS method, but you've had some great luck with people on your team that have really yeah, so multifamily versus single family. So single family just talks about one family living in the home. Multifamily is multiple families, right? right? Now, some people are very fearful in buying multi-units. Yeah. I definitely wasn't gonna take on a multi-unit my first time around. Right. I don't know about you, Austin. No, but, thanks. Um, but Rose on my team has had a lot of success. And the reason we get excited about these type of events is, you know, it, it's such a great opportunity for you, the individual, to earn an, a living for your family. And it's nice when you meet investors, and Jay and I will talk about this in a minute, but when you meet an investor who has something figured out or they can teach you some tips and tricks, it's exciting to be able to talk to somebody. And that's really the goal of this webinar today um, is, and is that. And but her, tell what Rose uh, yeah, so did Rose's a VA story. loan and she Yeah, so in. Rose on my team is out of Spokane, Washington, and her and her husband, before they had kids, wanted to purchase investment properties. Now they both come from families that have taught them to purchase investment properties. So when Rose bought her first one, and I don't quote me, it's either she bought a two unit or a four unit, but it wasn't single family. She lived in one unit, they fixed up the other unit, rented it out, and then the next time she purchased again, they did it again. It was a four unit, I believe. And Kyle, her husband, did the same. Now, when I get to hear Rose talk about this, it's pretty exciting, because I never did that. When my kids were young, we bought a house to live in. We didn't buy multiple houses together, which is what multi-units are. Now, my sister's looking to do the same thing with a VA loan. So we're gonna talk about this real quick, um, not let it be the focus, but with VA loans, you know, VA is for primary residents, but that doesn't mean you have to buy a single family home. Now, if Austin, let's say, was in the military and he had VA benefits, mm -hmm. him and his wife could buy a fourplex, let's say, with zero down. Right. Because that's what the VA can afford you, right? It's the best. Now, you and your wife will live in one unit, right. and then you can rent out the rest of them. And really, you can go on to repeat this multiple times, whether you're a veteran or not, you mm -hmm. can purchase and live in a property and then go on to purchase and live in a property, which I think that's what you were saying you I would mean, do, that's Austin, probably, right? probably, yeah. Essentially, our goal and ideas of everything is that, you know what, we don't necessarily maybe have that 20% that we're willing to put down to buy a strictly investment property. The primary residence that we've been in for you know six years now, we love that home. It's in a great area. Um, and we know that we're gonna need some more space, that we're gonna outgrow that, and we're looking for that next, next place property. that we're gonna move yeah. into. But we're like, I'd mm -hmm. still love to keep this one that we're in right now, turn yeah. that one into an investment home. Yeah, if you, if you were listening to us today and you own a primary residence and you wanna own more than one property, get with the person that invited you here, yep. and they can explain how purchasing using the tool of primary residence each time is valuable. Multi-unit is one of those ways. Exactly. So don't be afraid of it, just get really good advice. And the conversation continues. You've got the comparison of traditional rentals versus short-term stays, um, and that's what you and your mm -hmm. husband did? Yeah, short-term stays are when you occupy the property for a period of time. The IRS wants you to do at least two weeks out of the year. So for two weeks out of the year, we, we go there more often. So you have to go to the beach for two I know, weeks? I know, oh I know. Honestly, we get really upset when we can't go there more than two weeks <laughs> out of the year. 
Um, and our son, who's one years old, has flown more than probably us in our lifetime. It's <laughs> incredible. But short-term rentals are when you share that property with other people, which sometimes can be an incredible blessing. Have you ever seen those short-term rentals with the book? And yeah. you can yeah. see every yeah. visitor that was there before you. I mean, mm -hmm. it just it's, it's a blessing to all of the people around you. But that's the difference between a short-term rental is somebody who's going to be there for a short period of time, and a long-term rental, which is probably what Jay's got set up on most of his, is where he plans to rent to somebody a year to two years at a time, where you're not moving people in and out of that unit. Yep, right? and that is long-term. They're very low maintenance. I, um, it's important to add that if you're just starting out, uh, I've been given the advice, and I'll share it, to buy them as close to you as you can within 75 miles or no more than one hour so you can drive by mm -hmm. your cute little puppy and pet it and yeah. make sure that it's safe. <laughs> uh, mine, every single one of my houses in Colorado is less than 15 minutes from my house, yeah. and three of them I drive by to work back and forth every day. It's how I found them. But short-term stays... You've done one in Florida. I've done one in Tennessee yeah. uh, in the Smoky Mountains, and it's managed. It's 30%. Yours is 20% fees, but it's an asset. I go and visit it once a year, but someone else is taking care of it. But I want to share with you that I was doing investments for seven years before I had the courage to invest in another state or long away. And it's stressful, yeah. isn't yeah. it? It, it is. really is it stressful. Is. So you have to be careful and get good advice. Mm -hmm. I don't think if we weren't going back and forth, we would have done a short-term rental. Those are usually at a distance and mm -hmm. you can't, you know, if the toilet overflows and you don't, you know, you're the, if you're managing like um, Jay and his wife do, you're the plumber, you're the electrician, you're, you know, whatever job calls on you that day. So that would be difficult to travel back and forth if we were doing that for that purpose. And I really think Jay, that's going to be our next investment is something close something long-term renters, something a different avenue than short-term rentals. And I think that's great because investors are like a fingerprint. We're all individual and separate. It's important for you to remember that uh, there's a big difference between cash flow and appreciation. Uh, multifamily, condo, stuff like that will actually have better cash flow, but you've got more risk with vacancies. Uh, single families and townhomes will actually be more uh, conservative with the amount of money you make, but their appreciation will be more consistent. It's just knowing which resonates with you the most. And then Christina, you talked about flip that house. It's just a commonly known term for purchasing a revenue generating asset quickly and then reselling it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people get really excited. I want to invest, but I don't know that I can hold on to it forever. So I'm gonna go and fix this thing up real quick, you know, cause maybe somebody didn't have time to purchase, acquire and fix it and then we can flip it, right? right. That's a great concept. Just be careful, right? Cause flips are, would you say those are the higher risk? They're higher risk, they're very complex, and now I would caution everybody to just take a step back and look at this right now in 2023 because we don't know. Prices may be the same price or possibly even less in a month or two. So you don't want to buy an asset, like you said, Austin, that you, you don't have the time to fix up yourself. There's a lot of people that are flipping houses right now that are just trying to give them away and they're more concerned about doing a short sale, which is selling it less than they bought it for, more than they are about making a profit. Right. That's just a warning. Well, and taxes are different, right, Jay? So you yeah. know, if, if you've acquired something and sell it off right away, you definitely need to look into the taxes that mm -hmm. that looks like. Because it's not like what Austin might do, where he's going to live in each property for two years or mm -hmm. more. And that tax implication does play into your... It's huge. You're going to have earned income on that, and then you're going to have to pay tax on your property profit and understanding flips you know there's wholesale flipping uh, not so much today where people just buy a house for 300 and sell it on Thursday for 330 because it was distressed retail flipping just understand that you have to have cash you can either use an existing line of credit or you can use hard money it's just right now line of equities have went from a baseline of two and a half percent prime to all the way up to 7.75%. We and we were talking about that too. I mean, with HELOCs and everything, if you're borrowing against your primary residence to get a line of credit to go towards purchasing your next home, you're like you're saying right now, maybe 
a little challenging and you know with how rates and everything the feds continue to hike rates may not necessarily be that best route to go about mm -hmm. yes absolutely and that leads us on to where we're landing this aircraft today and that's very conservatively just starting with a single family exactly what you said austin when you saw this slide i mean essentially it's you know not everybody has that capability to be able to put down that huge chunk of money and that may be somebody's fear of i don't necessarily have that kind of capital to be able to do that i do own my residence today i would love to keep that as an investment property i know that i'm going to be needing to move towards that next you know, home that we're going to be living in for a while. Mm -hmm. So we can keep that home that we have now as an investment property. Yeah. And then you have a primary residence. The best way you know all of the squeaks and the creaks in your house. Right. You move into that. You can put 5 or 10% down. Sure. You don't have to put the 20 or 25%. But if your spouse does not want to move the kids, then save up your money and you can buy a single family investment property with at least 20% down. And this type of investment will give you 10 to 60% right. return mm -hmm. on investment. Well, and it's the least, I would say, when it comes to the consumer, it's the least fearful investment is their own, right? It's Absolutely. their initial primary residence. Mm -hmm. And if that's as far as you go, we understand. But I think if you're anything like Austin J or I, you want to know, okay, I liked this. Mm -hmm. We lived in it. And I want to know what else we can do, right? Yeah. And, and mark my words when I say it doesn't matter whether it's Colorado. It doesn't matter whether it's Tennessee. It doesn't matter whether it's Florida or Washington. If you can find a house in 2020 that was a $300,000 house. I assure you that's going to be a $600,000 house by 2030. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because in 1970, when inflation started, a house was 24000 In 1980, when Ronald Reagan was running for office, that exact same house was 54000 over 100% more. Mm -hmm. Because when things get expensive, company profits get minimized, but value in houses that you already own gets more valuable because the next one being built costs more in materials and labor. And that's what I wanted to end with here, you guys, before we go to question and answer. I've had a lot of people come to me, Austin and Christina, <laughs> say, what, a, what is happening in real estate with this inflation going on? And it's not just this year. Inflation in real estate has been happening for like three to four years. Right. But in 2019, 20, and 21, it was inflation of the prices. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to buy a house in 2021 for 400000 good luck. If you put $100,000 down in this example, you would go ahead and see that you would have 25% down, then you um, now have $25,000 because of the competition, you have to offer over that price. I did that for my house in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Yeah. Just because of competition. And you really, you had to, the reason that was, right, is because you had to be the winning offer. You right? had to be the winning mm -hmm. offer. There were so many people mm -hmm. that wanted it. Yeah. What else was going on too? I mean, where were rates at that time? Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. We had four and a half percent rates on a investment property. Right. So that's why everybody was getting in the game, but you've got a house that you're paying too much for, but the mortgage is only $1,800 principal interest taxes and insurance. So people just kept moving forward and more and more people snowballed into the game. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are today. Instead yeah. of the home prices being inflated, the home payments inflated. Right. So you now can get a house literally for 30 to 50, call it $40,000 less than you could 12 months ago. Right. So your mortgage is smaller, your down payment is smaller, the seller's giving you your closing costs, but then you're hitting the jaw with reality that you've got six thousand extra dollars just to secure a rate that sucks. Yeah, seven and a half percent. Yeah. So you've got a twenty-two hundred dollar principal and interest payment, four hundred dollars more than the folks that bought it in twenty twenty-one. Okay, Jay, but isn't interest temporary? Right. There was a famous quote that went out. Austin's got it. I believe it. yes. I mean, essentially, the the motto has been for the past you know, as long as we can been saying it, is you're marrying the home and you're dating the rate, period, at the end of the day. Because, because you got the house forever, exactly. but you can change yeah. that rate. Something else changes. Your rent goes up over time as well. Exactly. But in this example, if you bought a house in 2021 for 400000 
but now you can save $40,000 for buying it less, but you have to pay $400 more a month for the right to get that savings. 40,000 folks divided by 400 is 100 months and you're ahead of the game for eight and a half years. And what can happen in those eight and a half years, Christina? Rates could go down. I, I like this part and we should focus on it for a yeah. minute. Between these two slides, What's super important, right, Austin, is that 100 months. Mm -hmm. Over the next 100 months, will you get an opportunity to lower your interest rate? Historically, that's yes, right? And on average, well, go ahead. And what's gonna go up? Appreciation. Mm -hmm. And rent. Exactly. So and it is the time to get into the market right now if you're ready, because Warren Buffett says when others are fearful, fearful yep. mm -hmm. you wanna be greedy or bold, but be careful in 21 and 20, 2020, 2021, when others were bold, it was time to step back and say, whoa, is this market really gonna stay this hot forever? Right, right. Well, I so, think there's a balance, right? I and mean, there is. Um, Austin and I will tell you, you know, it definitely is something you need to consider because 100 months, a lot can happen over 100 months. Oh, I mean, sure. it, it really is something that we've learned being in the industry the short period of time that we've been in, mm -hmm. in lending is that, you know, homes come and go off the market, that is true. I can't imagine going back to a time when we're paying 25,000 over just to be the winning bid. I and, hope we don't. And the whole concept of appraisal gaps was a big deal, right? Oh, so yeah. so to be the, the favorited offer you had to just give the seller more money. Right. I mean, that's incredible. But and, and you don't have a lot of power in that, but do you have more control and more power? You can't control the rate market, right. but you can choose when you're going to take the time to refinance into a better rate, right? right. I, mean, I mean, the I think, what's the statistic? The, the average length of time that somebody keeps their mortgage, mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, was it three to four years before uh -huh. they're either gonna be selling that home, they're gonna be refinancing, the you know rates are going to continue to fluctuate and so you know those people that were on the fence in 2021 they were saying uh you know what let's just let's just hold off for a little bit i think we're going to wait another year to buy and everything that house in 2021 versus in the beginning of 2022 let's just say uh -huh. i mean would they miss out on think about all that appreciation all that yeah. equity did they miss out on because they had to ask that much over asking price and those people that are that did buy then are saying cha-ching cha-ching yeah yep and this is the bottom line you have to do your research you make your money when you buy the house not necessarily when you sell it so buy intelligently do your research and we want to help you we're going to go to q a i think now so um with that, we want you guys to know to arm yourself with information. That's what Jay is here to tell you today and Austin and I will back that up. It, it, it's just a matter of having the conversation, arming yourself with information. So um, Tracy, is that our first question up there? Okay, Austin. Okay. Did you me read it? Yeah. Okay, so the first question here is, I'm in the process of trying to get a primary residence, but wonder if it's a better option to get an investment property first. Ooh, good That's a good question. question, yeah. What would you say, Jay? Um, the best way to buy your first investment property is one that you live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because then you can buy it with less money down. You can be in it and experience home ownership while you're experimenting in the future with investment property ownership. Then you can prepare yourself. You can prepare the house. You put less money down, you're gonna get a more competitive rate, and then just be patient. This is a long-term game. And in the next two to four years, when you feel comfortable and your cash flow is strong again, after you put all your money down, you're settled, then you can buy another one and do what Austin's doing and get into investment property because you don't know if you are gonna like it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it the way we mentioned it, then you once you turn your property Austin, or in this example, a great question, into an investment property. If you find out that this stresses out Bailey, after a year you can sell it and because of the IRS rule that you need to mm -hmm. occupy the house two of the last five years and sell it with no capital gains at all, then you can experiment and you have an exit strategy. And Mike Hartwick said, it's always good to keep your reverse gear in good working order. <laughs> so we're conservative, but great question. Next question. You go ahead, read it. Uh, does real estate investing have to start at a single 
duplex, triplex, quadplex, which I think would be fourplex mm -hmm. level of investing, how do I scale up to the larger multiplex level of investing? So um, technically you Use could Rose. you could start at any level. Yeah. Ro in Rose's case, she bought a multiplex, I believe is the story. I, I don't think they bought a single family ahead of time. They didn't have any kids, so for them, that was a good fit. When I was younger, I had children, so having my kids in a multiplex didn't necessarily appeal to me. So really that can be anything. Now, if you're rate conscious, I'll make this caveat for this time in the industry. If you're rate conscious, um, primary residents have the lower rate. They always do. They're, they're the less risk, right? Yeah. Um, and rate is always relative of risk. And so if you're worried about interest rates and where they're at, to Jay's point, start with your primary residence first. If that means single family, go the single family route. Mm -hmm. That's great advice, Christina. Now this question here is really personal and I love it. What is the timeline that you guys have had with building your income investments? How long did it take each of you to get to the point that you're at now? And I'm gonna share with you first, Ooh. you guys, because okay. this is really emotional for me. Go ahead. Um, Marlo and I were married and the reason that we got into investment property is like many marriages, we went through a separation. And unbeknownst to me, my wife had her parents buy a house that she could stay in, and I loved them so much for doing it that she didn't have to live in a dangerous apartment complex. But when we finally got together, together again, and you guys, this is in our 40s, Marlo sat on the edge of the bed and she goes, I have one more thing to tell you. And I was scared. <laughs> and she said, my parents bought a house. I told them I'd buy it back. There I said it. Folks, investment properties is not about the money. It's not. It's about the freedom. It's about the growth. And I changed as a man and a husband that moment. Instead of telling her one more time that I was smart and she was dumb, which pilots and A personalities like me do, a small voice came in my head and said, you know what, honey? I guess we're going to be investment property owners. So everybody's story is different. We didn't get it together, together till our 40s, but we were determined and we skyrocketed in less than 10 years, right. have eight properties, seven that we own outright. But your story is very different, Christina. Well, I mean, that was a wonderful story, by the way. I've, <laughs> yeah. met, I've met your wife, she's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, mine was different. Uh, for us, you know, my husband that I'm married to now was my uh, marriage later in life, actually. Uh -huh. And Joe had never bought a house. And in That's Washington, scary. I'll make this quick, I promise. In Washington, when you would go and look at a house, you had five seconds to decide before somebody <laughs> was making an like offer. That. And that was astronomical to my husband. He's like, how could I possibly make a decision that fast? So buying our first home was frustrating, but once he became comfortable like a lot of people with that first home we're living in it okay for us to the emotional point i knew this is a secret i hope joe's not listening uh, <laughs> i this knew is good. that if we bought a home close to his family mm -hmm. he would consider it right yeah i mean because that's really what sometimes it is it's it's not about the money i mean we all are excited about the potential that money brings to us that freedom but really Sometimes it's necessity. Yep. Sometimes it's um, opportunity for us to be close to our family. And sometimes, you know, for Austin, it might just make sense if he wants to build generational wealth. Mm -hmm. I love the concept of generational wealth. I mean, it's just like you're saying, the, the freedom. What's the cost for freedom? To have that, yeah. that kind of freedom and something that you can pass on for generations and generations. Yeah. yeah. And it's baby steps. And this next question, it's a good one. Uh, what loan type is being used with real estate investing? Mm -hmm. um, traditional loan types, I mean, you're going to talk about your conventional options. It's pretty much that only it's only kind only of option. option. Yeah. You can't do well, FHA. property when you buy it, but you yeah. and Bailey, if you buy a sure. new house, if you're a vet, you can use your VA loan. Mm -hmm. If you guys only want to put 3.5% down, Correct. you can use an FHA so, loan. Yeah. And Different if circumstances. If you're strictly just trying to buy your 20% down payment, doing your regular investment property, you're just straight out trying to buy that, conventional options are going to be that only option to go. But if you are owning your primary residence today, you're trying to make that next move to something else, um, you can look at other options that are, have lesser of a down payment. You know, you can even do conventional at 5% so or FHA or VA. Would you say 
Austin uh, purpose at the time of purchase sure. dictates the loan type, right? right. It, it, if it was um, Austin and Bailey's first home, they could go FHA, they could go VA, they could right. go USDA and conventional. But if you don't intend to purchase it or um, live in it right away, then you're only right. stuck with if conventional. You, if you are strictly saying, mm -hmm. I'm buying this as a investment property income generating, conventional is gonna be that only loan type essentially for that. Mm -hmm. Tracy, did you wanna go back to that one? Uh, yeah, okay. so Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. what are good Ooh. investments for dividend income? What do you have Microsoft there, right? I mean, we have a lot of stuff. Um, Who's the aircraft? Uh, Boeing. 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 Boeing is a great one. Yeah. Microsoft's a great one. Um, Microsoft's a really good one. It's one of the most profitable companies in the world. But there's a lot, and that's a couple. Um, well, and remember that dividend income is stock ownership. So, mm -hmm. you, so I think Dave says mutual funds for sure. But buy in things you know and yes. like and use. So yeah, in the you, Pacific Northwest, we do. We have Boeing. We have Genie. We have, gosh, there's a lot. Somebody's going to be in the audience going, blah, blah, blah. Christina, but you, you have, have to really these. consult yeah. a professional because buying a common stock with a dividend can be as complex as buying a house. That, it's, that was my father's expertise his whole life. He made... Fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year in his retirement off of five million dollars worth of stock. Marlo and I, my wife, were blessed to say, "How can we do this in less than twenty-five years?" And in less than ten years, from beginning to end, we went from zero dollars a month of residual income to twelve thousand dollars a month of residual income, which is almost the same as his money was worth the six thousand in the late nineties. Mm -hmm. So, just get a coach. <clears throat> Next question. What source do you recommend for knowing accurate current rental rates? Rental.com. You said it earlier, yeah, rental.com. Just go to rental.com, put in the um, zip code, and just see what houses are renting for. And you keep it simple. Um, if you're really curious, you watch how many days. If that house is on the market for 30 days, that ain't the rent, because nobody's renting it. So that conventional, private, website will steer you the best, in my opinion. So don't answer this one. Let's see I won't. if Austin I like this. and I know. I like this. I know it just because I work with somebody every day. Who that says uses this. this. Do, we, do we read it? Yeah, go ahead. What is the KISS method that Jay mentioned earlier? You want to take a shot at it? I think it's keep it simple, stupid. There it is. No, it's keep Still. it simple, sweetheart. Oh. <laughs> we Don't call somebody dumb. We, say we just called you an idiot. Okay, wait, wait, wait. The person who uses it. Oh, Michael what? Brown. He's a well, he's a big Kiss fan, anyways. Just in yeah. general. Yeah. So but. that's funny. Okay. Yeah. Any last questions as we uh, wrap this up, Austin? Uh, can you explain the 2022 appreciation at 30, uh, 34,000 in example. your example? Very good. That's in Colorado Springs. There's a 8% appreciation on a median priced house, and that 8.5% on my model times the house value was $34,000. Was that for what was the value you had on the purchase? On that that house? was a $400,000 yeah. yeah. house, and it appreciated $34,000, which equates to 8.5%. Tennessee was more, mm -hmm. and Eastern. Washington. Washington, Washington was, was more. even more. Yeah. But if you're in Peoria, Illinois, sorry, it's like zero. I mean, if you're in Buffalo, New, Buffalo, New York, it's not going up that fast. So that answers your question, though. This is a good one. Okay. I know we're going to wrap up, but I we're going to wrap I, up. I really think we should answer this. What does the concept? You make the money when you buy, not when you sell. And I know Jay said that a lot, so I'm glad mm -hmm. we're talking about this. So what do you mean? Yeah, what it means is that you may love a house and you might think it's really cool and you've been looking at it for years, but if you don't crunch the numbers to make it a profitable endeavor, and this drives my wife crazy because I do it even with houses I live in. I would never buy a house with a, a primary bedroom on the second floor because you make your money when you buy the house and I know within the industry that ranchers and main level master bedrooms are always going to be more valuable than what do we have two stories and now we have tall skinnies that is a three story a two story on top of a garage shotguns skinny yeah so that's what I mean you need to make good decisions up front both in the type of style the elevation of the house and of the price if the price is not good, you can't be emotionally attached. You have to walk away and stay within your rules 
That's why you make your money and your decisions when you buy the house. You just don't become hopeful when you sell it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. This is recorded so that you can rewatch it, share it out. We're also going to provide additional question spots, drop-ins on a, um, social at churchillmortgage.com. And then I just want to thank the panel today. Um, each person volunteered for this, and we were happy to share the information and knowledge to give out to you guys, whether it's personal, whether it's your life's goal to own multiple homes or just one home. We understand where you're coming from. Do get with the person who invited you so they can go over a strategy that fits with your finances. Mm -hmm. um, we also are starting a support group here at Churchill for Houseaholics. <laughs> and like we me. will like provide um, a support group. We will. As, um, as it's needed, because Jay definitely has got me spurred on. And I know when my husband talks to me later, he's going to be like, great. So what are we buying now? Yeah, um, so thank you, guys. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this. We will do other podcasts like, or not podcasts, but live events like this. Yeah. And we hope that you tune in. Thanks, guys. Have a great day and go buy an investment property. There you go. <laughs>